dans leurs interactions. Donc, merci beaucoup d'être venu et euh, je vous laisse la parole. Thank you, uh, Thomas. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Um, a pleasure also to contribute uh, to your discussion on what I think is a very important uh, topic. Um, especially, I think, if we turn to the past, um, as I'm going to do uh, today, the acceptability of narrative is really what I would call a moving target, a moving target, because there are so many angles that we can bring to a, a case study. The angle then, the angle now, and possibly a number of angles in between. So um, at the outset here, I'd like to state um, more or less categorically um, that I want to combine um, an evocation and analysis of the past uh, with an awareness of the present. An awareness both uh, with regard to my personal contemporary perspective on the case study and um, also with regard to the more general concerns we have today in connection with hegemonic uh, or even racist terminology and imagery. So um, in the Q&A later uh, today, uh, please don't hesitate uh, to take me to task for flouting uh, these intentions if you think I did exactly that. That being said, um, I don't know just how familiar uh, you all are with uh, the American author Thomas Pynchon. So in order not to lose uh, those of you who don't know his work too well, uh, let me briefly contextualize uh, what standard literary histories still like to call his important role in American literature of the last 60 years. Um, in this part of my talk, you'll notice uh, an upbeat tone on my part. Um, I'm making this tone explicit uh, here at the start because it indicates that I have a stake in this author. Uh, so you will also be the judge of whether that stake uh, overdetermines my contribution uh, to the discussion of acceptability uh, I want to work towards. Um, first, a few biographical facts. They're not unimportant uh, because Pynchon has reached a point where his author image, and of course the, the theory references here are to Sandra Heinen and also to the notion of posture um, coined by uh, Mesos. Um, his author image constitutes a considerable part of the reactions uh, to his work. Pynchon was born in 1937 in Glen Cove, New York, that's on Long Island. At 16, he entered Cornell University as an engineering physics major, but remained in that program for only one year, switching to English. After his second year at Cornell, he served for two years in the US Navy. That's the picture you see on the left of the slide. Then returned to Cornell and graduated with a major in English in 1959. From 1960 to 1962, Pynchon worked as a technical writer on the staff of the house magazine at Boeing, Airplane Corporation in Seattle, while completing his first novel on which I'm going to zoom in uh, soon. Once that book uh, started to garner praise, uh, Pynchon became impossible to find. We have hardly any pictures of him. <clears throat> Apparently, he lived mostly in Mexico from late 1962 until 64 or 65, then mostly in various places around California until the 1980s. In 1988, he accepted a five-year MacArthur Foundation Fellowship. Since about 1989, he has lived in New York City with his wife, the literary agent who is also his agent, Melanie Jackson and their son, uh, who, whose first name is Jackson. So that doesn't make things easy. Uh, in 1997, uh, if the paparazzo um, who was involved is to be believed, 
Kim Jong-un was still quite aggressive in fending off interest in his person, but there is a picture uh, which appeared along with the story uh, in the London Times. And in 1998, he made sure to block a batch of all private letters between him and his agent that had unexpectedly become the property of the Morgan Library uh, in New York. But in the last 25 years or so, he's now 86, uh, Pynchon has mellowed down a little and started playing around with his invisibility. He agreed, for instance, to a fax interview for a biography that had a deceased friend of his as one of its subjects. And he also lent his voice to two episodes of The Simpsons, in which he was presented as a reclusive author with a brown paper bag over his head. He also narrated the commercial video Penguin Press put uh, out on YouTube for his 2009 novel Inherent Vice. And for the trailer of his last novel to date, which is called Bleeding Edge 2013, uh, there is a young man, possibly Pynchon's own son, uh, who is wearing a t-shirt that says, I'm Tom Pynchon, and who is bragging about his stature in New York's Upper West Side, um, the neighborhood where Pynchon happens to live on West 82nd Street, to be precise, if you ever want to go there. Speaking of playing around with his own image, uh, I am playing around with his image as well. Uh, the picture on the right is a computer animation uh, of the old Pynchon based on another picture from 1953. I didn't make it, I just found it on the internet, of course. Okay, um, on the strength of his first three novels, that's V dot, capital V dot of 1963, the Crying of Lot 49 of 1966 and Gravity's Rainbow of 73, Thomas Pynchon became the epitome of American postmodernism. While the label postmodernist was not attached to Pynchon until the late 1980s with um, Brian McHale doing some of the heavy lifting there, it does capture, that label, does capture many of the features central to his work. A historical novelist, even when his story is set in or near the present, Pynchon renders the past with such great ingenuity, humor, and self-awareness that along with the writers whom you know, E.L. Doctorow and Kurt Vonnegut, he provides a main source for the concept of what Linda Hutchin has called historiographic metafiction in her treatment of postmodernism. Often working against conventional characterization, plotting, and perspective, his novels address such topics as capitalism, paranoia, technology, genocide, slavery, and terrorism without succumbing to pedantry or simple caricature. I told you there was going to be a upbeat tone to my presentation. Uh, before zooming in on his first novel, V, let me zoom in on the novel he is most famous for, Gravity's Rainbow, to give you um, a more concrete idea of what everything I've just said might mean. Ostensibly a book about uh, the end of the Second World War, Gravity's Rainbow is organized around the adventures of Tyrone Slothrop, an American lieutenant stationed in London. Since his erections during the V2 Blitz of 1944 seem to predict the sites of rocket strikes, he is first subjected to scientific study in England and then sent to the French Riviera for experimentation. Adopting a variety of identities, Slothrop escapes to the zone, that's the novel's name for Germany in the immediate aftermath of the war, 
to search for information and wisdom, eluding pursuers and going through experiences that range from the comic to the truly harrowing. His itinerary includes the underground factory uh, near Nordhausen, where V2s were manufactured, uh, manufactured with a lot of help from the prisoners who lived in the attached slave labor camp called Dora. Uh, his itinerary also includes the rocket development and testing facilities at Peenemünde. As Lothrop, the main character, eventually dissipates, the novel not only follows the rise and fall of a so-called counterforce, dedicated in part to rescuing him, but it also completes without necessarily resolving the narratives of other important characters. At the very end of the novel, it suddenly jumps from a flashback to the firing of the rockets on the Lüneburger Heide in Germany in the early 1945 to 1970s Los Angeles, where another missile, and most readers in the 1970s would immediately have thought of the atomic bomb, Another missile is falling on the movie theater in which we readers suddenly seem to be sitting. Steeped in the smallest details of mathematics, statistics, chemistry, ballistics, psychology, music, film, astrology, and the Kabbalah, to name only some of its more evident topics, Gravity's Rainbow encyclopedically investigates war as a high mass of corporate capitalism. Its stranglehold on the individual and its global role as arbiter of life and death. Okay, as you can tell from this final sentence, um, the novel mirrors the concerns of 60s counterculture. But in fact, it raises the possibility of subversion only to leave that question in suspense, especially if you take in the importance of its effect on readers. If the novel's wild counterfactuality, Pynchon is inventing all kinds of stuff, if the novel's wild counterfactuality is seen by readers as a liberation from the shackles they, the invisible rulers of this world, also put on history by turning it into a simple sequence of cause and effect in which good and bad keep going head to head, the act of reading Gravity's Rainbow may be invigorating in and by itself, especially if, as a reader, you accept Pynchon's invitation and indulge in the making of connections among all the elements on offer. If, on the other hand, such creative paranoia, that's what the novel calls this way of reading, if such creative paranoia appears to exemplify the repressive tolerance, that is one, that is one of their specialties, and the reference course here is to the philosopher Herbert Marcuse, then Gravity's Rainbow risks exposure as a hoax for letting its audience mistake intellectual labor, reading this kind of difficult book, for an expression of freedom. However we decide that question, the novel is so masterly in construction, so rich and varied in detail, so lyrical, touching, spectacular and funny, sometimes all at once, that the reader's pleasure is guaranteed. And maybe, just maybe, and you may want to disagree here, pleasure is a form of freedom, whether it's acceptable or not. Again, um, you can tell from my rhetoric that I'm invested in Pinson, uh, probably because I've been researching his work uh, for a very long time uh, and therefore something of a fan. But I will add immediately that he and his work have not gone uncontested uh, in the last decade or so. I've mentioned his 
last novel to date, Bleeding Edge of 2013. That book, on the one hand, uh, rode the wave of techno paranoia reinforced by the Edward Snowden revelations a couple of months before the book came out. But at the same time, uh, it was trashed by some because it exemplified Pynchon's supposed habit of putting women in demeaning positions, as one Australian reviewer put it. I'll be glad to return to the um, aspect of supposed misogyny uh, in Pynchon's work uh, during the Q&A, if you think that's important for what I'm saying here today. Okay, now, long introduction. Let's turn to V, Pynchon's first novel, which is the real topic of my talk. V was published in 1963, as I've already mentioned. It's a historical novel that intersperses chapters set largely in 1956 New York with an almost chronological sequence of chapters set in various locations in Europe and Africa from the end of the 19th century onwards. The 1956 storyline centers on the picaresque adventures of the character called Benny Profane, ex-sailor, former road worker, sometime alligator hunter, sometime night watchman, among an array of other characters, including former shipmates, would-be girlfriends, and the members and satellites of a group of pseudo-Bohemian New Yorkers known as the Whole Stick Crew. The other storyline, anchored in the first, centers on the character of Herbert Stencil, the middle-aged son of a British diplomat slash spy, and especially on this man's, Herbert's, efforts to find out about the reference to a certain V in his father's diaries. From 1956, Stencil is trying to trace the supposed role of this mysterious V in the violent and chaotic events of the 20th century, from the potentially apocalyptic Fashoda crisis of 1898, as seen from Egypt, to the siege of Malta during the Second World War. The result of Stencil's investigation, this is important to keep in mind, is the sequence of historical chapters I've just mentioned, chapters that I would say narrativize his findings about this mysterious figure, V. Okay, um, so much for a quick summary. Let me now turn to what I will call uh, the genetic side of things. The standard um, edition of V, that's the Harper uh, Perennial, uh, just like the uh, first edition, by the way, consists of 492 pages divided into 16 chapters plus an unnumbered epilogue. The typescript acquired by the typescript of V, acquired by the Harry Ransom Center in Austin late in the year 2000, consists of 685 numbered pages divided into 30 chapters. All in all, the published novel has about 25,000 fewer words than the typescript. So, what happened? The long answer to that question is in the essay by John Kraft and myself, uh, an essay I listed in my short bibliography for today. Uh, but for my purposes here and now, I'll suffice with uh, following. Pynchon submitted a first version of his novel to his editor, Corlys, or Cork, as he used to be called, Smith, in the summer of 1961. In the spring of 1962, he rewrote his novel, following a few suggestions from his editor. But the Pynchon-Smith correspondence, which 
Corksmith uh, graciously provided uh, to John Kraft and me. That correspondence shows that Pynchon had merely been waiting for these suggestions to expound his own ideas for the revision. He responded with a 14-point plan to a letter in which Cork Smith had made only three remarks. However, Pynchon did address these remarks, so they must have seemed important to him. For instance, in order to avoid the reader's potential confusion at the relatively late moment, the typescript switches back from 1956 to Egypt, 1898, for the first of the historical chapters. He moved the chapter forward and added a two-page introduction to it, in which, first of all, he thematizes uh, historiography, and second, an introduction in which he also frames the multiple focalization in that Egypt chapter as an imaginative way of transcending the vantage points of an individual narrativizing character, that would be stencil, uh, and perhaps the vantage points uh, of, by extension, the author, Pynchon himself. But that's just speculation. These two, stencil and Pynchon, are, after all, trying to make sense of the history of the 20th century up to, let's say, the late 1940s. The added introduction insists on the creative power of the historical imagination. And judging from other historical chapters in uh, the published novel, the titles are on the slide, including Confessions of Fausto Maestral, which is a very special diary about the bombardments on Malta between 1940 and 1943, and also Mond Augen's story, uh, which is the rewritten version of the typescript chapter on the 1922 uprising of a local people in German Southwest Africa. Um, judging from all that, Pynchon was clearly keen on pushing the boundaries of that historical imagination. I'm not going to expand on this today, but uh, what Pynchon does, for instance, uh, with the dreams of his main character in that Southwest Africa chapter in terms of intersubjective consciousness evocation is absolutely stunning. Now, Thomas has already referred to it, uh, along with my American colleague and friend, John Kraft, I published a book earlier this year with Ohio State University Press on the difference between the typescript and the published version of V. Using the framework of what we call genetic narratology to do so, and following up uh, on the uh, Poetics Today essay by Bernards and Van Hulle, I'm not sure the title of the essay is uh, big enough on screen. It's called Narrative Across Versions, Narratology Meets Genetic Criticism. Today, I'm going to expand on one of the chapters in that book because it gives us a very clear narratological case study about acceptability. Finally, we've reached a kind of hard work. Um, it's a case study surrounding race, as it raised a number of questions of acceptability and characterization before and during the rewriting. I'm going to be talking about the reduction of a specific black character for the final version of the novel. I will obviously be doing this from my white angle, and I hope you think uh, that's allowed. Uh, I also hope my use of the word black doesn't make you uneasy, right? Uh, the alternative African-American um, seems to have gone out of fashion uh, a little bit in at least my academic circles. And I prefer black anyway, because to me, it sounds 
less defensive, but obviously we can talk about that later on. Okay, now, if we want to prepare ourselves a little more for the discussion of this character reduction, I believe it's important uh, to know, first of all, that Pynchon's early work repeatedly engages with race. From uh, a short story called Lowlands uh, in 1960, uh, which came out in 1960, 60, uh, featuring, quote, a fat Negro with a pork pie hat, unquote, to his 1966 New York Times essay on the riots in what, LA? Uh, an essay with its, this is a quote from an article about uh, the Pynchon essay, with its pessimism at the prospect of an oppressed people who have persisted for too long in believing the white version of what a Negro was supposed to be. Pynchon provides ample evidence of a readiness to confront the racial divide in the United States at a time when it was rapidly becoming a central political concern. I wouldn't say that the Pynchon of the 60s uh, struggled to work through the issue of race. That might be too tendentious, uh, either negative, suggesting he had a hard time, or positive, implying a degree of overt socio-political activism. The formulation um, experimented with racial representations is probably truer to the uneven process that can be observed in the coming into being of V, to which I'm going to turn uh, in a moment. Now, however you describe uh, his development from the late 50s, early 60s uh, onwards, Pynchon's early um, efforts with regard to race uh, prepare the way for what is happening with race in Gravity's Rainbow, right? There uh, you have a motif of transgressive blackness. You have the not quite surreal presence of black Southwest African soldiers in war-torn Germany, they were there, but he still amplifies that to such an extent that really it's some kind of all-out game with race. But that's 1973. And with V, we are still in the, as it was coming into its final version, we're still in the early 60s. A comparison of the TypeScript and the published version of V clearly shows that Pynchon reduced and toned down the role of the black saxophone player called McClintic Sphere. McClintic Sphere. His name will show up a number of times in the remainder of my talk. Now, my aim here today is to look in detail uh, at the changes to Sphere to see how they affect our understanding of that character as an index to Pynchon's portrayal of race and of attitudes toward race uh, early in his career. Um, I will have a conclusion, of course, at the end, but as a preview uh, to the rest of my lecture, I'm going to say the following. The characterization of Sphere, of that black saxophone player, uh, in the published novel conveys some insight into the social constructedness of racial identity. But the typescript shows that Pynchon's main black character, despite this character's own awareness of, and indeed scorn for what he sees as the quote, northern liberal routine, we'll get back to that later, um, that character risks appearing to be little more than a hodgepodge of beat-inspired cliches, garden variety liberal sentiment, and limited close personal experience. Other people have other ideas about this. I will be referring uh, to at least one of them, but I think uh, the perspective of acceptability will allow me to develop exactly this overall interpretation of race in Pynchon's first novel. Okay, 
to start with, uh, let's go back to the correspondence between Pynchon and his editor, Cork Smith. In a letter of um, February 23rd of 1962, uh, the one in which uh, Smith made those uh, three remarks I mentioned earlier on, um, this should be more legible uh, for you. Um, Smith recommended that Pynchon cut Sphere, that he cut the black jazz musician from the novel, warning that, quote, he strikes something of a false note. Okay, that's quite smart. He strikes something of a false note in that he somehow leads the reader to believe that the Negro problem is going to become at least a side issue, end of quote. Smith believes or hopes it's not Pynchon's intention to write a, quote, protest novel. And so to avoid that kind of reading, fear has to go. Okay, now let's apply the perspective of acceptability to figure out this suggestion. I think if we do that, there are at least two ways of understanding the suggestion. On the one hand, we could imagine that Smith, um, being a literary professional after all, was aware of the Black author James Baldwin's rejection of the genre of the protest novel. And that therefore, for Smith, it was not acceptable for Pynchon to incorporate that genre, right? Okay, we're, I'm imagining this, right? I have no evidence of it, but okay, here is a professional literary editor. He's supposed to keep track of what's going on. Um, if not in the US overall, then at least in New York. Uh, Baldwin was in New York. Um, he was, yeah, making quite a bit of noise, if I can call it that. So I think that uh, Smith was aware of this. Okay. Um, in the essay uh, that I've also listed, and you can find the first page of it on the left side of the slide that is currently up on screen, um, Everybody's Protest Novel, it's called, which came out as early as 1949 and was then included in the 1955 collection Notes of a Native Son, that title being, of course, a reference to the novel Native Son by the famous Black author Richard Wright. Baldwin harshly criticizes Wright's novel by stating that Native Son is a strong example of the general point that protest novels fail because they do not engage the full reality of existence, human existence, instead reducing people to simplistic categories and thus, in fact, even reinforcing the standard opposition between the oppressor and the oppressed. Protest novels, perhaps especially those written by white authors, might give white America you want to call it that, a righteous sense of concern for the oppressed, but nothing more than that. Okay, if all of this is contained in the editor's suggestion to Pynchon that he should cut the black character, then that suggestion has what I would call ideological value. Smith tells Pynchon not to fall into the trap of the protest novel, a genre that wouldn't be acceptable because it actually does the opposite of what it pretends to do, that is to improve the lives of black people by drawing attention to their oppression. The other way of understanding the editor's suggestion is perhaps less positive. If Smith argued on the basis of what V was probably about for him, Right, And here I could refer to an interview um, I was lucky enough to do uh, with uh, Cork Smith a long time ago, 
Um, if Smith argued on the basis of what V was probably about for him, namely a historical novel about incitements to violence in the 20th century, up to late 1940s, then maybe he thought, Smith thought, an evocation of race in the 1956 chapter was going to complicate the issue by making it too close to home. Now in this second, again, it's speculation, but still, huh? in the second reading of the suggestion, bringing in race in the 1956 chapters was not acceptable for Smith because it would demean the more general intentions related to history that Smith was attributing to Pynchon when judging the first version of the novel. Still, uh, in his letter, we go back to the same quote, still in his letter of February 23rd, Smith advises Pincham that sphere, quote, may be expendable, that he is not crucial in his actions upon the other characters, and that the character of Paola Maestral, who is the Maltese daughter of Fausto, Maestral already mentioned, and that the character of Paula, uh, who connects with with Sphere while she is working as a prostitute and calling herself Ruby, can simply again quote from the letter disappear for a while from the plot. As what as what Smith himself calls his most major suggestion of the three suggestions he made in that letter for revising what came to be V, this all sounds rather insistent. But then, interestingly, at the end of his remark, he relents a bit. Quote, if, on the other hand, you feel that sphere is an integral part of the book as a whole, just say so. In other words, Thomas Pynchon proved to me that your black saxophone player is acceptable after all. In his reply of March 13, 1962, Pynchon reacts to this recommendation by first agreeing, and I'll give you the more uh, detailed quote, um, reacts to this recommendation by first agreeing that he did not intend to write a protest novel, but then defending Sphere's connection with Paula and his importance to the novel's 1956 plot in general. He even claims that the Sphere subplot is the novel's only part he consciously plotted. He also explains the importance of Paula with her ambiguous racial identity likening her to the central V character of the historical chapters through the attribute they share, and that is disguise. The word appears both in the typescript and the novel. So here, Pynchon offers a literary and a thematic motivation for the acceptability of sphere. Nevertheless, Smith seems to have hit a nerve with his suggestion about McClintic sphere. In the same letter, we're still looking at the same quote, Pynchon readily admits to hinting at a rivalry between sphere and another character, the record executive Rooney Winsome, with a white Winsome being fixated on Paula and liable to feel that sphere's black sexuality threatens his. Winsome's masculinity. Although Pynchon stands by the importance of that dynamic for the novel, he promises to tone down the friendship between Sphere and Winsome so it doesn't come across so much like a dogmatic piece of political theater from the 1930s. And this is where I get the title of my talk for today. Uh, Pynchon literally says the following to Smith about the friendship between Sphere and Rooney, quote, I will try to make it a little less 
doctrinaire liberal than it was actually meant to be. I cut that second part because it would have been too long for a title of a lecture. Okay, now this is Pynchon following up on my first reading of the suggestion by Smith, right? Realizing that the white liberal protest novel is not acceptable because it's too white for its own good. I can put this a bit more neutrally. Pynchon does imply in his letter to Smith that race in his novel is always experienced as mutually charged. On the one hand, because the black man is a threat to the white man's sense of his own sexual identity, and on the other, because the black man's um, because the black man is the object of a white liberal striving for amicable desegregation. Pynchon does not overtly connect the two in that letter, but he does acknowledge that the embodiments of racialized experience in the typescript might seem to take the novel in a wrong direction. Okay. As a result, Smith may well have thought Pynchon had agreed to do something about this issue when revising the novel. And just to make sure, he returns to the subject in his letter of March 22nd, in which he addresses all the points in Pynchon's March 13 letter. Smith's conclusion about Sphere betrays his continuing concern. Um, quote, I think, as you suggest, the best course will be simply to keep an eye on Sphere's tendency to represent protest. It's tricky, end of quote. Tricky indeed, the character stayed in, but Pynchon made many changes to him in an effort it seems to accommodate the ideas of his editor. I've already said that he notably reduced the race angle and the overtly political liberalism of the friendship between Sphere and the white record executive Rooney Winsome, yet he did not eliminate all traces of protest. He did not do that. That's why I'm calling it some kind of hodgepodge. Let's now see in some more detail uh, how Pynchon negotiated the unacceptability of the protest novel in V, as it was pointed out uh, to him by his editor. Um, I want to focus on the context in which that negotiation took place as well. Okay, uh, here is the, uh, the tricky bit, right? I should have given you that earlier on. But you've heard it. Okay. Um, given Pynchon's two year stint in the recently integrated US Navy, I don't really accept uh, the critic David Peter Whistling's idea that, quote, jazz was the primary cultural site through which Pynchon had any knowledge of African American culture. Okay. Uh, the cover of of Whitling's book is, is on the left of your slide. However, Pynchon was definitely a jazz enthusiast, right? Of bebop in particular. As he put it in the introduction to Slow Learner, and that's his 1984 collection of stories from the late 50s and early 60s, he and a friend of his would go down uh, and listen a lot to Ornette Coleman, who at the time, uh, so we're talking 1959, who at the time was coming on, this is a quote from the introduction to a Slow Learner, new revolutionary from, for some, messianic. Okay, now, from an early review of V onward, uh, critics have often identified Coleman or Ned Coleman as the model for the Clintic sphere, um, whose venue, um, whose connections with Fort Worth, and whose method and lineup, that's a quartet without a piano, 
four parallel colons. Okay. Now let's uh, take a little detour. On uh, November 23rd, 1962, when V is in its final preparation phase, Pynchon wrote an anxious letter to his publishing house, wondering whether legal trouble might result from his use of the name Steel. He had just heard on the radio in Mexico, where he was living at the time, that gas pianist Thelonious Monk's middle name was Fear. And he was resigned to changing his character's name if necessary, even though, as Pynchon explained, his character, quote from that letter, blows alto, alto saxophone, not piano, and his name was chosen because, and this is the important bit, because a sphere is a non-square in three dimensions. Okay, this is this will sound a bit pedantic, right? But uh, I think it's important to know for a proper understanding of McClintic sphere. Uh, given the cultural divide in the 1950s between hipsters and squares, right, in American culture, uh, and given the positive connotations jazz had for young intellectuals. Um, in the late 50s and early 60s, I think it's safe to conclude that Pynchon wanted the name sphere to allude geometrically to the so-called hipster. Okay. The connection between hipsters and jazz was certainly in the air at the time. The remark, um, the 1957 remark in the magazine Harper's Bazaar that quote, the hipster may be a jazz musician, unquote, will strike us today as less than profound. But, yeah, uh, but uh, the remark seemed weighty enough at the time for Norman Mailer to promptly turn the paragraph in which that remark appeared into the epigraph for his essay entitled The White Negro. Okay, so. You can hear where I want to end up. Now, um, of course, if I say that um, the hipster uh, may be a jazz mu musician strikes us today as less than profound, uh, what I really mean is it has become a cliche, right? I think we can all agree on that. Um, and that may, of course, weigh in uh, on our view, our contemporary view of Pynchon's creation of his main black character in the early 60s, right? This is indeed where our um, contemporary perspective might start dominating our eventual evaluation of the acceptability of sphere. Okay, now, anyway, Norman Mailer was definitely important for the early pension. Describing um, his own uh, 1959 story called The Small Rain in uh, that same introduction to the collection uh, of his early stories, Pynchon recalls the conflict he experienced on the one hand, uh, between on the one hand, what he calls the undeniable power of tradition, and on the other hand, an exciting, liberating literary movement linked to two contemporary authors in particular. And I'm quoting from the introduction to Slow Learner. We were attracted by such centrifugal lures as Norman Mailer's essay, The White Negro, the wide availability of recorded jazz, and a book I still believe is one of the great American novels. On the Road by Jack Kerouac. Since the slow learner introduction is a very strategic public statement, it might be naive to take this reminiscence at face value. However, especially when considered together with the emphasis on beat bohemia 
in the patient stories, lowland, entropy, and the uncollected mortality and mercy in Vienna, also of 1959, it does tempt me to ask whether Mailer, Kerouac, and Jazz, in some combination or other, helped shape Pynchon's early racial views. Needless to say, such an influence might also entail, entail rather an adverse reaction, but I would say that's not the case here. Let's turn to Kerouac for a moment for the next step in the argument. Um, referring mainly to Kerouac's novella, The, Subter the Subterraneans, forgive me, of the Subterraneans, the Subterraneans, yeah, of 1958, uh, but making the point about his work as a whole, the critic John uh, Panish, and you have the quote on the slide, has shown that, quote, Kerouac's novelistic attitude toward racial minorities is similar to the stance of those romantic racialists of the 1840s and 50s described by the cultural historian George M. Fredrickson, who in African Americans discovered redeeming virtues and even evidences of superiority. The press minorities in Kerouac, Panish goes on, embody existential joy, wisdom, and nobility that comes from suffering and victimization. In his essay, The White Negro, Mailer betrays just this sort of romantic primitivism with respect to Black people. Mailer's white hipster hero, self-divorced from society, models himself on the Negro because the latter, and this is the quote from uh, the Mailer essay that is on screen now, has been living on the margins between totalitarianism and democracy for two centuries. Having, quote again, stayed alive and begun to grow by following the need of his body where he could, the Negro has given voice in class to his rage and the infinite variations of joy, lust, languor, growl, cramp, pinch, scream, and despair of his orgasm. Thus, Mailer turns Black men into the champions of a subversion he strenuously promotes in an effort to rejuvenate and intensify the American experience. Okay. The critic Robert Holton sees the Black character called Bolingbroke in Pynchon's early story, Lowlands, which I've already mentioned, as an illustration of Pynchon's early romantic primitivism in the depiction of race. I see the saxophone player in V as another but less straightforward example of this early romanticizing tendency. It's another example of that tendency because of Pynchon's admission to Smith that he had intended to portray the friendship between Sphere and Winsome as politically liberal, with Sphere as a wise and serene Black person who is really much more suave, much more laid back than that record executive called Rooney Winsome. Pynchon himself may have this primitivist inclination in mind when, still in that slow learner introduction, he deplores, quote, an unacceptable level of racist, sexist, and proto-fascist talk in the story Lowlands. He does not resort to attributing this objectionable voice to one of the characters. He says, sad to say, the voice was also my own at the time. Again, the introduction 
to this collection is a public statement designed as a typical first person narrative centering on the lessons learned by the writer and therefore Pynchon may well exaggerate the earlier so-called racism consciously or not to make his mid 80s self look better but still when talking in the 80s about his early stories, he is literally speaking about an unacceptability. Right? I'm so glad that word was there. Uh, you can imagine <laughs> about an unacceptability with regard to what he sees as their racism. Now, does this racism also hold for V? And if so, does that mean Pynchon needs to be cancelled? Right? You knew I would get to that question at one point. Uh, well, let's see. Spear is most often discussed in V criticism in connection with a catchphrase he articulates after Paola reveals her real identity as not the black prostitute he has fallen in love with, but the homesick daughter of Paola, um, forgive me, the homesick Maltese daughter, Paola Maestral. Keep cool, but care. That's the catchphrase, right? Um, there was a pinch and list ages ago, and people would sign off with that, right? Keep cool, but care. Keep cool, but care has been read in diverse ways. Affirmati affirmatively, as an ethic of temperance, and as the creed or imperative Pincham teaches to his readers. But it's also been read negatively as banal, I'm giving you snippets from, from secondary material, uh, as banal and as unconvincing bubble talk or the sort of slogan jargon mongered by advertisements. From my angle, we need to focus on cool as a hip term of the period. While cool, and you see the, uh, the sleeve of the Miles uh, Davis album there, um, while cool had become a popular style by the time Pynchon was writing V, his emphasis on it in Sphere's catchphrase nicely fits with the suggestion that Pynchon may have taken more than one cue from Mailer's White Negro, especially considering the fact that Sphere's catchphrase is the conclusion to the understanding of flipping and flopping he has developed into an assessment of mid 20th century history. Here's a quote on the slide. The only way clear of the cool, crazy flip-flop was obviously slow, frustrating, and hard work. This is fear, right, in the novel. Laboriously explaining the vocabulary of hip, Mailer ticks off an entire list, including swing, groove, cool, which is then defined as being in control of a situation because you have swung where the square has not, right? and flip and pension picks up this last word and has sphere paired with flop as the basis of his growing understanding first of electronics which shouldn't bother us here i hope uh, and then of history okay now um if we project pension's later uh, stature as an arch postmodernist on all of this, such borrowing could, of course, indicate that Pynchon was, in fact, spoofing, parodying Mailer, right? And Sphere's catchphrase, keep cool but care, might sound trite for that reason as well. But to interpret Sphere as merely parodic seems too reductive, even when that interpretation is based solely on the evidence of the novel's final version, as was the case for uh, the critic David Whitsling, whom I've already introduced and whose reading on race in V this is, right? 
um, McClintic Sphere is a parody of um, Mailer's Hipster. There is, according to me, there is definitely something intentionally positive to Sphere. And I've already alluded to it earlier on in a scene that is present in both TypeScript and published novel, Sphere reflects scathingly on self-absorbed college types in the audience who either, quote, would go through the old northern liberal routine simply by inviting him over to their table or else would demonstrate their very superficial appreciation of contemporary jazz by asking him to play the Duke Ellington classic Night Train, which is really one of the most uh, obvious numbers uh, in the repertoire. So deploring the white image of the black jazz man as a hip entertainer, Sphere embodies, at least on one level, an effort by Pynchon to represent a black perspective on the racial attitude that Pynchon, as a young white listener to contemporary jazz himself, may have wanted to distance himself from, but perhaps couldn't really, given the influence of Mail. Now, if parody remains a possibility in all this, then the incompatible, these two incompatible strands of the sphere character must be regarded as intentional. Whereas I would argue that they are the result of the author's caution, indecision, or even lack of insight into his own procedures. Right? He was still learning, after all, at the age of 24, 25. Okay. Something else needs to be considered when we're trying to assess race as it develops between TypeScript and published novel. While racial identity seems elusive in V's 1956 plot, you remember the two uh, plots, let's say, um, the novel makes an emphatic point about white supremacy in the historical chapter nine, already mentioned, Mond Augen's story, in which, according to the critic Cyrus Patel, Pynchon hints that the story of colonial oppression in Southwest Africa is but a version of the story of the American South. Patel also highlights how the jazz club scene at the beginning of chapter 10, which I've just referred to, connects with the novel's preceding chapter, right? the Southwest Africa chapter, which ends with the image of a mutilated native singing a song the German engineer Mondhagen cannot understand. Now, if this image, as Patel claims, conveys a feeling, short-lived though it may be, of hopefulness and possible harmony after the racial hatred that has been described in the South with West Africa chapter, Sphere's ruminations at the beginning of chapter 10 about shallow white collegians at the, uh, about shallow white collegians, and this is still Patel, indicates that any apparent harmony between the races masks an abiding dissonance. The sequence of the published novels chapters nine and 10, which was already established in the TypeScript's chapters 20 and 21, suggests yet another interpretation of Sphere, the contemporary victim of white oppression. And it does evokes the long view of interracial experience that is more central to the 1956 plot in the TypeScript than to its reworked equivalent in the published novel. However, it is crucial to mention in this connection that Pynchon extensively rewrote the Southwest Africa chapter at the very end of the revision process. We have evidence of that, right? So after agreeing that he didn't want to write a protest novel, okay? 
in revising the Southwest Africa chapter, he actually made its motif of white on black violence, even genocide, more conspicuous. Perhaps partly in an effort to compensate for the reduction elsewhere in the novel of the main black character Sphere's role. Pynchon may initially have agreed with Smith that protest was unacceptable because it would seem too didactic or proletarian or counterproductive or otherwise unhip as an intended effect of his novel, but white supremacy and its deadly consequences remain integral to his evolving representations of 20th century history. So if the character of McClintic sphere is probably uneven, that doesn't mean Pynchon was erasing white oppression from his novel in his effort to negotiate the impression and effect of what Smith called protest. Okay, um, I'm now going to address some specific changes between TypeScript and published novel. And um, yeah, I'll just say what I think should be said here. Uh, in doing that, I will be quoting from the TypeScript. And some of these quotations will contain the N-word, okay? Uh, I personally think it's okay to pronounce this word in our academic environment uh, because it always appears as part of a quote, right? I will have my quote fingers up, huh? but um, seriously, if you object, I'm willing to compromise, right? Uh, on screen, you will see N dot dot dot, okay? <clears throat> In what became section three of chapter eight in the published novel, three characters, many profane Pig Bodin and Rachel Owlglass, go to the V note jazz club to hear Sphere. And so uh, you have a, um, a photograph of the uh, TypeScript chapter on the left of the slide. The TypeScript devotes a little more space than the published novel to the interactions among the characters. When Rachel hears about Sphere's contract with Winsome's record company, she is surprised. Quote, what's happening? You, the spokesman for racial equality, and Rooney, the white rebel, who goes out and strings up a nigger every morning before breakfast just for drill? Sphere replies, yowzin, Miss Rachel, brotherhood week. Sure enough, Sphere has not in fact been portrayed as the or even a spokesman for racial equality earlier on in either the typescript or the published novel. So it must have been easy for Pynchon to drop this suggestion uh, of Rachel's, not least because it is accompanied by her shocking uh, characterization of Winsome, uh, whom Sphere has just called your friend. Now, if Winsome is a racist, he is a somewhat more genteel and educable one than Rachel jokingly, probably also between my quotation marks, suggests here. Rachel's remarks constitute a rather unsophisticated setup for what Pynchon admitted was originally intended to be a programmatically liberal friendship between Sphere and Winsome. Since Pynchon had agreed with the wisdom of his editor's advice to tone down this aspect of the friendship, cutting the passage, which is what happened, was probably an obvious move. As a result, Sphere's reply in what may have been meant to pass for ironic or not so ironic black vernacular goes out as well. Brotherhood Week itself may also have seemed unduly liberal 
in view of the editor's critique. And since black vernacular, sure enough, would return some 55 page later in spheres much more sarcastic and angry thoughts about young white members of his audience, which I've already brought up, Pynchon may have had few qualms about dropping it here. Another passage now. Except for two names, nothing was dropped from the original version of that later jazz club scene at the beginning of the published novels, chapter 10. In Sphere's subsequent visit to Paula, in her guise as the prostitute Ruby, however, the typescript has her greet Sphere as Studman. And that may have seemed too suggestive of threatening Black sexuality, as Pynchon conceded to Smith on March 13. I've given you that quote. Since the prostitute's greeting was dropped, Sphere's reply had to go as well. And here it is. You are too young to get into that groove. The tight satin dress and the orange hair and this sexy come on honey baby jazz me a little. Anybody can read about that in a paperback. You want to be what's already been driven into the ground. And I don't mean horizontal. Unquote. Sphere reads Paola's greeting as symptomatic of her wish to act the part of a stereotypical prostitute in an effort to play up to pornography-driven male fantasies. Sphere urges Paola to reject stale props and poses in favor of freshness and authenticity. Removing this passage, which is what happened, this passage of gentle criticism also eliminated a connection between sex and jazz. Come on, honey baby, jazz me a little. That line may suggest the typescript sphere's awareness of the hipster image found in Mailer's essay. The critic David Whitsling might have wanted to recuperate his awareness as evidence of the postmodernist heteroglossia he finds in the published novel's jazz club scene, since it would endow Sphere, a parody of Mailer's hipster, according to Whitsling, with an ironic insight into his own critical function with respect to Mailer's primitivism. However, judging from the amorphous Sphere evidence in the typescript as a whole, I prefer to see a youthful attempt to do too many things at the same time rather than fancy postmodernist footwork. Longer deletions related to Sphere were made in what became chapter 10 of the published novel. First, when he and Paola Ruby broached the subject of her Maltese father, Sphere ruminates in the typescript on the interrelation of cultural whiteness and blackness. Quote is on screen. And something else strange too. Times Ruby acted white. Now whites can show up anywhere. McClintock had seen enough of it to recognize its symptoms. White was snapping your fingers on one and three. Sometimes it was even snapping your fingers at all. White was a certain kind of suit and a certain kind of car and McClintock himself wasn't immune to that. Maybe he figured there is a little white in everybody. Then Sphere's move away from racial essentialism is illustrated in his friendship with Winston. Another quote from the typescript, so this has all disappeared um, in the final version. Now, Rooney came from a Jim Crow town and if McClintock and he had only seen each other once, they would have come to the judgments redneck and nigger, so it's even within quotation marks within the quote, with maybe a half-voiced bastard thrown in there immediately and left it at that. Only 
it turned out that Winsome wasn't the stereotype any more than McClintic was. And the only people they knew were trying to be, um, and the only people they knew were trying to be, were the women each cared about. Mafia, that's uh, Rooney's wife, and Ruby. So they'd become friends. Whether these thoughts undermine a reading of Sphere as a spoof of Mailer's hipster depends on how serious we think they are. The passages themselves do not provide definitive clues. They do work against the limitations of the image projected by Mailer and Kerouac, but they do so in the realistic vein that in its clumsy effort to overcome stereotypes may betray its own limitations more than anything else. If Pynchon's point in his letter to Smith about doctrinaire liberalism is his whole story about these two men, Sphere and Winsome, then we could be dealing here with a young man of 24 or 25 who was still in the process of learning how to think beyond the conventional depiction of racial integration, an ideal he may have developed as an objective for American society in the course of his privileged white education for now. On the other hand, if Pynchon was already capable at the time of playing around with the notion of race in some of the ways he would demonstrate later in his career, then, but only then, right, Sphere's reflections on whiteness can be read as ironic. Now, from where I'm sitting, the evidence seems to weigh more on the side of earnestness. And I think the correspondence between author and editor is quite crucial here, right? If Pynchon had been keen on spoofing Mailer, he could have used that purpose as an argument in his defense of Sphere to his editor, but he didn't, right? Also, Pynchon makes a clear effort to develop Sphere in terms of psychological and sociological realism, as even Whistling acknowledges when he says about the sphere in the published novel that Pinch Pynchon's construction of him, contrary to what a typical postmodernist would do, is not determined by the disappearance of, a quote from Whistling now, psychological depth, political commitment, and agency generally associated with the waning of affect that we all know well. Okay. Um, Spears' thoughts on whiteness occur uh, in the context of his effort to understand Paola in her guise as the prostitute Ruby. He thinks she exaggerates exaggerates, forgive me, her behavior uh, the way, quote, a white boy sometimes will hang out at all the Negro Elks and jazz clubs just to prove he's not prejudiced and he knows it and it scares him. Okay, so there's all these references to, to jazz, jazz clubs. He's very, Pynchon is very self-aware uh, about that. Um, and we have to be lucky that he cuts most of that stuff for the final version uh, of the novel. Now, Sphere goes on to connect race and sexuality twice, once implicitly by likening such, compens such compensatory behavior to that of, quote, a boy who's afraid he's queer, unquote, and again, explicitly by speculating that Paula Ruby is, quote, trying to screw all the white out of her. You have the quote, on screen as well. When Winsome in the typescript expresses pain or shame over the pernicious popularity of his wife Mafia's novels full of racial and cultural stereotypes, Sphere assures him it's just as bad on the other side, just as much of the deep end. Okay, now we're getting to, uh, well, maybe not the heart of the matter, but some strong stuff. Uh, that was uh, removed for uh, the novel. Uh, this other side, 
uh, is the other side of the racial divide. And the racist extremism sphere uh, refers to is exemplified uh, by the black activism of a, quote, tall, full bearded patriarch whose speech or a sermon sphere takes Wintem to Harlem to heal. This patriarch is by far the most militant character in the typescript. He denounces worldwide white Christian oppression, and he proclaims the color of the remedy. Quote, white is the color of sin. White is the color of evil. Jesus Christ was a white man, and for 2000 years in his name, unimaginable sin was and is being committed. The African nations have been exploited by colonialist Europe in Christ's name. The American Indian has been all but wiped out in Christ's name. The American Negro has been stepped on, burned out, lynched and beaten in Christ's name. The color of the Antichrist will be black. The Antichrist is anti-sin and anti-evil. Only the black Antichrist will be able to bring good and peace to the world. In his name, white, uh, in his name white, the color of sin will be wiped off the earth. That's some strong stuff, right? And it's easy, right? So um, we have to be glad if you're sort of trying to express a literary opinion uh, about, about all this, we have to be glad that it was removed. Um, now, still um, same episode, New York City, uh, the principal site of white decay will also be the site of the great destruction. Uh, either brought down or else fallen through what could be called, um, and I'm using uh, one of Pynchon's novel titles here, its own inherent vice. Quote, New York is the ripest and the rottenest of the fruits of the 20th century and of Christ's sinfulness. What better place for an apocalypse, the coming of the Antichrist? Prepare yourselves. Prepare for the Antichrist. Prepare for the fall of New York. Prepare for the night when down Broadway will march a million black faces to bring good where evil has fallen to erase white from the face of this fallen city, from the face of this fallen earth. Okay, now, if Pynchon's editor hadn't already started feeling uneasy before, this passage in the typescript may well have been what caused him to worry that Pynchon's book would be read as a protest novel, it's obvious. Pynchon would have his New York apocalypse eventually, and in fact, twice. And there's a nightmarish, relatively short episode in Against the Day, uh, his 2006 novel. And then also uh, he wrote about 9-11 um, in Bleeding Edge. Um, so I suppose that's New York apocalypse for you. But he removed this anticipation of the New York apocaly apocalypse from V. Still, the speech does show his early willingness to tackle the racial divide in the US. It briefly extends the representation of the black community beyond sphere, okay, to evoke the tension in the civil rights movement between, on the one hand, Martin Luther King Jr. and on the other, Malcolm X who was still affiliated with the Nation of Islam when Pynchon was writing. A fact that may explain the couple of Muslims in the patriarch's audience and the reference in the speech to a Muslim as a potential antichrist. Nevertheless, Pynchon may not have been quite ready yet to deal with all the radical implications of such a marked contrast as the speech establishes between the non-violent good Negro and the militant bad Negro. So Rooney doesn't get it. And here's the other quote on the slide. 
Bruni refuses to take the social or moral issue seriously. With Sphere's concurrence, he trivializes the speech, undermining its effect as they return from Harmon uh, afterward. It doesn't seem to matter what side they're on. I'm quoting, everybody sees some kind of a new order. It's leap year. It's a pres presidential election year. It's the Mozart tercentenary year. Is it supposed to be a year of apocalypse too? Now, for a set of final quotations, I'm keeping an eye on the clock. Do not worry. Um, for a set of final quotations, let's look at some rather minor changes between typescript and published novel now. I want to group them because they add extra nuance, I think, to what I've been saying so far. Okay, here's number one. In what became the novel's chapter 12, the typescript has winsome reply to Sphere's greeting at the V-Note Jazz Club with, oh, my faithful darky retainer, uncle, I need my luck changed, which becomes in the novel, the published novel, man, I need a change of luck, no racial slur intended. That last revision is a curious one to say the least. Uh, it eliminates the condescending racial epithets, darky and uncle. Man is hip as well as literal, probably. At the same time that it retains and even calls attention to the insult of applying that sphere, perhaps simply by virtue of being a black man, is a pin. Okay? Sphere, apparently not insulted, agrees enthusiastically to take Winsom to one of those Harlem cat houses I'm always talking about. Okay. Um, when Winsom recognizes Ruby as Paula in the same novel chapter, he asks her how she has managed to pass for black. Um, burnt cork like a minstrel show, she tells him. But Winsom catches on to the joke immediately and tries another uh, explanation, namely the uh, constructedness of race and Paola as either reflector or chameleon. And this is the second quote on uh, the slide. You didn't use anything, didn't have to, no makeup, mafia. That's Rooney's wife, you will remember. Uh, you know, thinks you're German. I thought you were Puerto Rican before Rachel told me. Is that what you are? Something we can look at and see whatever we want. Protective coloration. And Paula uh, expands on this notion of racial ambiguity. Final quote on the slide. Nobody knows what a Maltese is. The Maltese think they're a pure race and the Europeans think they are Semitic, Hamitic, crossbred with North Africans, Turks, and God knows what all. But for McClintic, for anybody else around here, I am a Negro girl named Ruby. And don't tell him, him please, Ma. So, and this is where I start working towards my conclusion. Uh, race in V, to a certain extent, seems to be in the eye of the beholder. That's what I'm getting from these final quotes. The state of mind, a cultural formation both a construct and a performance. Although Sphere's impression in the typescript that Ruby sometimes acts white got cut from the published novel, his perception reinforces the interracial determination of racialized experience as it figures in V, both typescript and published novel. But it would be wrong, I think, to promote that into an overall interpretation of race as a focus of the rewriting of the novel. The typescript pages about the revolutionary patriarch in Harlem suggest that Pynchon at this early part in his career, uh, this early point in his career was on the threshold, always a nice image to conjure up, 
was on the threshold between a rather conventionally progressive portrayal of attitudes toward race, on one hand, and a more radically militant one. But apparently, he waffled, right? didn't know what to do. He took some of the potential threat out of sphere, and he took a threatening character, the patriarch, out of the novel. Um, okay, between brackets, part of the reason for taking the patriarch out was likely artistic as well as political, since at the same time he also took uh, a reactionary misogynist demagogue out, um, who was to be sure a much less plausible character than the patriarch. Okay, so that's one point. On the other hand, in the revising the Southwest Africa chapter, uh, Pynchon also dramatically intensified his depiction of the consequences of racism, perhaps regaining some moral ground, even if at the safer seeming remove of a historical episode, and reinforcing the differentiation between what the novel calls stencilization, that is the um, act of narrativizing all the data that uh, stencil was able to find in connection with V. So reinforcing the differentiation between stencilization on the one hand and the realism in terms of character that is one of the outcomes of the rewriting process. Realism uh, of character in the 1956 plot. In my view, as bravura, a performance overall as V is, the TypeScript version of Sphere presents a case of what has come to be called racial ventriloquism. As a performance, it is simultaneously self-conscious to a fault and relatively unsophisticated. If Pynchon had not already recognized some of the risks in the TypeScript's construction of Sphere, he must have been relieved that Smith pointed them out. In other words, Pynchon might well have been wondering already whether his black saxophone player was acceptable. And his editor made him go back to the character on literary as well as ideological grounds, causing a reduction that could be described as more acceptable, but still fraught with what I, uh, safely speaking, of course, from uh, a time in which it is easy to condescend, uh, what I must be careful to judge. You will also remember, of course, that I've made my own bias uh, as a pension scholar explicit earlier on today. So here is my very brief conclusion. Many sphere passages were cut or rewritten so as not to foreground race and thus activate the idea of a protest novel. But Pynchon may also have been glad to eliminate others because as a fast learner, here is that upbeat tone again, he realized they were not so clever. The resulting published novel, including Sphere's catchphrase, keep cool but care, which is the measure of Sphere's moderation as opposed to the patriarch's militancy, is still somewhat green and blessed with too many good intentions when it comes to the treatment of race in contemporary America.